today. Um, my name is Maggie Mortali, and I am the director of the interactive screening program for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And I have the pleasure of presenting today with two of my colleagues at UCSD who are both using the interactive screening program on their campus. Um, so I'm going to do a brief introduction of the program, a bit of its background, and how it got started, and then they are going to talk about their adaptation of the program and how it's being implemented on their campus. So the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention is the leading national not-for-profit organization that's exclusively dedicated to understanding and preventing suicide through research, education, advocacy, and to supporting people, reaching out to people that are struggling with mental illness, mental disorders, and those that are impacted by suicide. In 2001, AFSP was approached by two families um, who had both lost their sons to suicide when they were in college. And um, they came to AFSP as survivors of suicide loss, but really with um, a plan that AFSP could help them implement a program on college campuses that would reach out to people like their sons who were sort of silently struggling. What they felt was that um, not only were they aware that their sons had been struggling with suicidal ideations, plans, and behaviors, but that um, their sons were not the type of people that would have gone and sought help on their own. And so what they believed was that there were a lot of people out there like their son that um, were, were struggling in silence and were not going to reach out proactively and get help even though that it was available for them. So we took to the research. We looked um, deeply into the research on suicide risk of students on college campuses. That's sort of the AFSP way is um, when someone is interested in working with us, we like to um, take a look at what's going out there in the field of research. What do we know about suicide risk? What do we not know? Um, oftentimes we can learn more by what we don't know than what we currently know. And so we really felt that um, there was a strong need for a program to reach out to students at risk. That students that were significantly at risk were not those that were coming forward with their problems. And, um, and that what we, we saw was that there were strong barriers to help seeking that those that need help the most are often the least likely to get help on their own. And so here I just have some of the, um, the stronger, sort of more prominent barriers to help seeking negative attitudes about mental health treatment, fear of being judged or stigmatized, concerns about confidentiality, um, fear of sanctions. I think this is a real fear for students. Um, coming forward with a mental illness, what does that mean? Does it mean that I'm going to have to um, take an LOA or um, am I not going to get into graduate school or get a good job after college because I had to um, you know, leave school for a period of time? But also what we felt was that there wasn't really a place for these barriers to be explored unless the student was coming forward and, um, and working with their counseling center. So um, in order to get these sort of barriers identified and addressed, they would need to be proactive, um, but they weren't. And so I think the, the barriers, what we, what we see is that they're actually adding to um, some of the struggle and um, are leading to students not coming forward with what they're struggling with. So what we developed was a platform whereby a student can anonymously explore these barriers with a counselor at the campus counseling center. So um, we took what we know about suicide and suicide risk on college campuses, we took what we knew about the barriers to help seeking, and we created a platform called the Interactive Screening Program, the ISP, 
based on these really core aims. So number one, we felt that the user needed to be anonymous, that it would help them to come forward if they could be feel safe and secure and completely anonymous from the counselor or the counseling center that it needed to be personalized. It couldn't just be this space where a student is coming forward with um, issues or concerns and they're getting this automated response, you know, you're depressed, go see a doctor. That it needed to have a personalized contact with a real counselor, a real person behind it that they could eventually meet. And that it needed to be interactive. It needed to be a, a place where uh, the student and the counselor could really converse. And that it was uh, away from a diagnosis, that it was really um, interactive engagement with a real counselor who was responding to what the user was thinking and feeling and not providing a diagnosis. So we created this web-based method for anonymously co connecting students at risk to suicide or other um, mental disorders and who provide information and then support for help seeking. The way that it works is it's a, a web-based platform that AFSP designs and implements for the university or college where it's being housed. The school decides which students to target, when to target them, and will send out email invitations to engage the students to anonymously connect with them through this platform. This might be a little blurry, but um, this is the student welcome page. It's a standard template. Um, so once the student gets the email invitation, they decide that they want to engage in this service, they log into this website, they sign up with um, a self-assigned user ID and password so that it makes it completely anonymous. Um, the student is encouraged to not use any part of their first or last name, no student ID, or anything really that would identify themselves through the username. And so it's also the way that they can log back into the website to further engage with the counselor. But the way that it starts is through a stress and depression questionnaire. So once the student signs up, they're encouraged to move forward with a stress and depression questionnaire. Um, it's based on the PHQ-9. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but a, a fairly standard uh, tool for screening for depression. Um, but also asks about uh, drug and alcohol use and abuse, eating disorder related questions, um, questions about sleep and appetite, asks about suicidal ideation, plans or behaviors, and whether or not the student has made a suicide attempt. It also provides an opportunity for the student to provide comments. Um, information about financial stress, perhaps, or a tough living situation, a death of a loved one, or a relationship breakup, so that they can really further expand on um, what's, been, what's been going on for them lately. At the end of the questionnaire, students are asked to provide an email address. Now, it's completely encrypted in the system. Again, um, they're completely anonymous. But what it does is it makes sort of communication back and forth from this website really seamless. So the website is actually going to alert the student when the counselor has posted a response and vice versa. Counselors get notifications from the website when the student has engaged in the stress and depression questionnaire or posted a dialogue note. So it's computer analyzed. We have an algorithm in the system that, um, that just goes through the questionnaire, different answers that the student has provided, and it's going to rank them in level of tier. Now the tier structure is listed here. Um, the questionnaire itself is not a diagnostic tool. It's really, again, treatment engagement, helping the student sort of self-assess what's been going on for them, but also providing an opportunity for the counselor to really learn more about what the student has been going through so that they can initiate a dialogue conversation based on what the user has been thinking and feeling. 
So within the appropriate time frame after the stress and depression questionnaire is completed, the counselor is then notified, they log into the system, and they review the student's stress and depression questionnaire. They have a template that they can base their response on, and um, it's really a, a, a placeholder for them to further engage with the student um, by using this template, but really expanding on it to address the individual needs of that student. The heart of the program is really begins with the counselor's response. It's an opportunity for um, the counselor to take a look at this student based on their questionnaire and um, pick out some key concerns that are really um, of note to the counselor and pose questions to connect with the user. So in reviewing a questionnaire, the student may have said um, they'd recently been having thoughts that they'd be better off dead or thoughts of physically harming yourself, right? So that's taken from the PHQ-9. And it's really the counselor's opportunity in the, in the response to address that, but also say, how long have you been feeling this way? Have you told anyone about this? Have you felt this way before? Um, really to form a connection, a bond with the student that shows them that there's someone out there that really, really cares about them and wants to talk with them more about what they've been going through. So unlike a, a questionnaire where they're just told, you know, go see your doctor, or go um, talk to someone, or these are your results, the counselor is really providing an additional opportunity for the student to further engage, to further connect with them in a really safe and secure way. And that starts with the response, but it's really um, built through a dialogue conversation that can continue on this website. So once the counselor response is posted, the student then gets notified that there's a response. They log into the website to view that response, and the best outcomes would be either A, they call and make an appointment, that they feel the sense of connection with the counselor, that they're ready to move forward and get connected with someone directly, or maybe they're not ready. Maybe they have a few more questions, maybe they still have a few barriers that they want to address, or they're just not sure what they need at this time. So then they're encouraged to, to dialogue. And it's a, a platform that looks like a chat, but it's um, based on a 24-hour turnaround, so it's nothing is done in real time. Um, one of the things about this program itself is it's really not meant for a crisis intervention service. It's really based on treatment engagement. So there's no need to have this sort of real-time back and forth conversation, but it's really a place to, again, have the counselor guide the student through what they're going through and provide them a framework on what are those barriers that they're going through, right? They see this student is at risk. They see that they're really struggling, that um, they have some, you know, some concerns but they're not coming in and getting help directly. So there must be something else that's going on that's preventing the student from coming forward. And that's really what the dialogue is meant for, to explore this with the student. So again, a critical role in the process, they encourage students to seek help by facilitating these resolutions of barriers. And it's also an opportunity for the student to kind of explore this relationship with the counselor, get to know them a little bit before coming in. So that's really the day-to-day -day operations. Absolutely. 
Yeah, I should have said that actually from the beginning. That's a great question. The question was, does the welcome letter state that this is not a crisis intervention? Yes. In fact, all throughout the website, um, it's stated that this is not a crisis intervention, that, but there are resources available on the site for if a student is in emergency, is in a crisis, and all of that is customized by the school. So they choose what resources they want to post. Um, whether it's counseling center-based resources, emergency contacts, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, or a local crisis line, all of that is available to the student. Um, the student is also told that there's this turnaround time, that the counselor is not readily available to them at their disposal, <coughs> that you know it may take about 24 hours to get back to them. Over weekends and holidays, it, it could take longer, that type of thing. Great question, thank you. Um, so in, a, in addition to the, the ongoing, the back and forth, and I only have a couple more minutes here, I see, um, that the, there's, the data is actually all reported and stored on the site. So um, because it's anonymous, that we have reporting systems that each school has access to, that um, as soon as a, a user, a student, accesses the counselor's response, that then gets stored in the database. So all the answers to their questionnaire, whether or not they read the counselor's response, when the counselor responded to them, what their tier was, um, if there's demographics that are being asked, their age, their gender, um, their race ethnicity status, that's really up to the school to uh, pick their demographics, their comments, everything, all their dialogue notes are stored in the system. So it's a really um, incredible way to not only engage your student population, but to also learn something about the students that are using this service. So again, if it's not targeted to everyone, if there's just a small group, you're not going to be collecting data about your population at large, but you are going to be learning something about this population of students that's really struggling on campus and engaging in this service. So each college, just to give a little bit of background just on the security level, each school that uses this site um, gets their own website and the purpose of that is really for it being absolutely safe and secure. It's stored on a separate server and database that AFSP um, owns specifically for this program. And um, all of the access controls and, and functions are completely protected um, by these socket layers that we invest in to make sure that there's just um, there's no level of, of hacking or getting into the site that everything is completely stored and protected. The resources that are involved, that's really part of it. We're, um, we're a sort of full service team. We customize your website. We work with you very closely to um, make this your own program, to implement the resources on the welcome page and throughout the site that um, are specific to your population. We provide training and um, ongoing support in technical functions, but also in content management if necessary. And um, it really has become this incredible partnership, not only with AFSP, but with um, the colleges and universities that are using the program. I think UC, the UC Systems is a great example of that. Um, because we have 10 schools using this program right now. And um, it, it really creates this wonderful community of counselors that are all um, sharing in their goals of proactively engaging students at risk. So the college and university, um, they provide the counselor. So the whole purpose is really to engage the students to use counselors that are on campus and available to see students. So that is, um, the, what the counselor or the school is providing, and, and my colleagues here will talk more about their experience in that. So again, um, AFSP is listed as, or, or the ISP I should say, is listed as a best practice, 
And um, we have several published studies that um, I'm happy to send anyone if they're interested in seeing uh, the research behind this program, some of the evidence and findings that we've found in just systematic um, data mining with, with a few sites. And then there's also um, separate schools that have gone ahead and, and provided their own research. Uh, UCSD Medical School has, has done a few papers in the last few years. Um, we have some from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, University of North Carolina. And I believe uh, Pitt Medical School is gonna be releasing one soon. So there's some comprehensive data I'm happy to, to share with everyone here. And, um, and then I'll just provide my contact information. If you're interested in talking with me about the program, if you're using the program now and wanna talk, um, or if you're interested in implementing it, I'm happy Happy to speak with you about it. And now I will turn it over. Thanks, Maggie. <clears throat> Maggie is actually our contact for all things ISP um, at AFSP and uh, has been really helpful. They have, like she was talking about, have an opportunity to have people come and collaborate and come together to uh, assist us with any type of problem solving that we need. And their response time is pretty miraculous. So um, we've really appreciated working with Maggie. And our work has been largely connecting via email, connecting in just phone calls. So it's a really nice opportunity for us to be able to present with her today and meet in person and talk a little bit about some of the things that we've been doing at UC San Diego. <clears throat> Excuse me, so I'm gonna talk today about, um, a little bit about how UC San Diego has been utilizing the ISP over the last three years. Myself and my colleague Jerry will talk about two different parts of it. I'll tell you a little bit about some of the ways that we have kind of put our own stamp on the program at UCSD. And then Jerry's gonna talk a little bit about some additional information that we also collected. Because this is a new program for our campus, we wanted to get a lot of feedback from the students that were utilizing the program, or even students that weren't utilizing the program and maybe some of the reasons why. So we'll talk a little bit about both of those areas. So um, like Maggie was saying before, this, this is something that's across all of the 10 UC campuses. This is something that was funded and it was a part of our deliverables from our three-year Cal Mesa Student Mental Health Initiative funding. And um, the, the program is really geared to look at those groups um, who aren't right now engaging in treatment and for, for many reasons have some barriers to seeking out that treatment. Um, so at-risk student populations were identified across all of the 10 campuses. And um, at UC San Diego in particular, we identified the graduate students as a whole um, as, have, as being our at-risk population that we were gonna focus on and utilize this program. And one of the reasons that we decided to do that is because our campus is, houses about 30,000 students. And about um, 4,000 to 5,000 of those students are graduate students. Um, but proportionally, we see a higher, higher proportion of graduate students in our counseling centers. And so we do see those as a, a higher risk population and also um, that there were differences across different graduate departments where we saw a good number of students and others where we had a very, very low um, percentage of students that were seeking our services from that department. Not because that program wasn't as stressful as other programs, and actually we may have even had some anecdotal evidence that those programs were probably more stressful, but um, so we wanted to just be able to have some offerings to graduate students in particular that would be able to allow them to see which ways they're gonna feel more comfortable engaging in treatment. Additionally, um, our campus, with the um, proportion of graduate student to undergraduate student, we also saw that many of our programs and outreaches could, could be perceived as geared towards undergraduate students and oftentimes eliminate students from seeking out some of our primary prevention activities that are housed either on the campus as a whole or through the counseling center. So we also wanted to have something specific for our graduate students that said, this is just for you. And I think that that really helped in um, just being able to engage with them and say, you know, this is, this is kind of like my special program. So I'll give you a little bit, um, Maggie also talked a little bit about this, and this is our welcome page to our unique website for the ISP. This is where the students enter in. 
and um, begin the login process. And a little bit, I'll kind of show you a little bit about where we put some of the resources. You'll see that we have UC Counseling Center resources just right up there. A little bit of information about our hours, when we're open, some of the ways that you can get in contact with us, um, and then followed by some emergency services. And those services were both county resources that were going to be available to all the students should somebody land on this page by happenstance and want to know a little bit about some type of um, suicide prevention or any type of um, concerns that they have. And then also some specific ones that were geared just towards our campus. So we have our UCSD police department information on there. And we also have some other resources that students may be um, needing or, or may see as being helpful as part of our crisis response. And then I think also the question before was about how do we inform the students about the type of intervention that this is going to be. And in that first main box, we really talked to them about what, um, what this is and what it is not. And um, in particular, letting them know that this is not a crisis intervention response, that there are resources on this page that will link you to crisis intervention responses, but that we see this as more as an outreach effort and a way to be able to learn more about some of the ways to engage in treatment. Um, some of the things also that's nice about this page and in working with AFSP is this page can be adapted and changed as needed. And so what we had also been able to do is during times when we may not have counselors available um, in our counseling center, we would also be able to put up um, something there about maybe our weekend or holiday time and that you may see a little bit longer or more protracted wait times for any of your responses. So again, that lets the students know this isn't something that you're going to be expecting and you should be expecting an immediate response from. And, and here's a little bit about why. One of the uh, unique pieces about how we have adapted the ISP on our campus is we really sought the support and feedback from a lot of different stakeholders across the campus. With us first identifying with graduate students as our target population, we really wanted to make sure that there were a couple of stakeholders, even within the graduate school, that were providing us feedback about what our program was going to look like on the face level um, when we were sending it out to students. So we were connecting with the assistant deans. There's a graduate life steering committee that we connected with, which includes some graduate students, some graduate coordinators or representatives from different departments across the campus. Um, and then also some people that do research on graduate students, um, some of the graduate student leaders, and also um, some of the other administrators that are part of the graduate school. In addition, we also utilized work from uh, a specific graduate peer mentor group. So this was a group that was in a department, and we wanted to get their feedback. There were, there were students that are really involved in connecting students to information and resources in and out of their department, and so we felt like they were going to be a great, a great place to be able to bounce some of our ideas off of them about how to implement this program on our campus. And as Maggie was saying, we've also been fortunate to have UCSD School of Medicine's HERE program, which is the program that utilizes the ISP, really just walking distance away from our offices. So we've been able to regularly consult with them over the last three years about how to do this program, what are some of the um, pitfalls, how are we troubleshooting these things, and really just be able to pick up the phone or walk over to their offices and have them be a great resource to us as well. So I, I put this up here. <clears throat> this, is, this is the intro email, and again, just like Maggie was saying, everything that IFSP provides to be able to start this program really serves as a template for us to be able to take it to the next level. Um, so this is that first, that first introduction email that um, we, that they encourage us to send out to the students. When we send this back to a couple of our stakeholders that you see on the page, um, they rip this email to shreds. <laughs> they said, graduate students are super busy, graduate students don't read things, um, and that um, they are, they're really quick on being able to make decisions very quickly about what they do and don't want in their inbox. So it can go straight to delete um, faster than anything you've ever seen. And it was super helpful feedback because we had provided this to them, <clears throat> and they told us a little bit about where to put the link, where to, you know, how to get this information out, what were some of the important pieces, what were some of the pieces that really they were never going to read about. And it was really great to get that feedback, and I really think that receiving that feedback and taking that feedback in was something that really helped in us getting um, a large number of student responses. So again, you'll see that this is that first email. 
And then what you have here is the email, um, and it's in its next iteration. Um, so you have here a little bit, we moved the link up to be able to have the students connect immediately. So um, even, if, even if, they didn't want, if they didn't want to read down, they at least had the link where, again, that first welcome page is where they'll land on, and they can get more information. We also created bulleted lists. We like to, the graduate students, and if you've ever been a graduate student, you just be able to like to list things down, like if it's a to-do list in your mind, because that's how you're kind of operating. Um, and then also, one of the biggest pieces that they really, want us to, really wanted us to drive home was that it was really clear that this was an anonymous resource, that they could utilize this, and that their academic departments didn't know that they were going to be utilizing it, and that this was not a part of their academic record. This is particularly important because, yes, we have graduate students or graduate departments that are ranged from about um, 400 students, but we also have those that are about five or 10 students. And so it was really important to have them feel like, one, they weren't targeted in this, and it wasn't going to one person in particular um, for any specific reason. And two, that this information wasn't going to come back to the department and hurt them in some other way. Um, and again, some of those things might be an unnecessary um, concern, but, we, th but anything that was going to limit or provide an additional barrier to seeking services or engaging in treatment, we really wanted to eliminate or reduce. So you'll see the differences between those two again um, and just the ways that we were able to kind of make it more clear and more streamlined for the students. This is also a little bit about, this is our rollout strategy. Now what we ended up doing was um, rather than us send out any emails, again, to provide that additional layer that we did not have access to any of their student information, we went to the departments and asked the departments to provide their support and have them send out the emails. What the, ways that, the reason that we decided to have them do that as well is because we wanted to show the students that their department cares about their health and well-being, and this is why it's going to come from your department. Additionally, um, like I said, students know how to delete things really quickly. And so if they saw an email from me, just some random person from the counseling center who they didn't have a connection with or didn't know anything about, that was, again, something that they could really easily discard. However, if they saw it coming from, oh, I don't know, the dean of their department, then that was something that they were going to perk up and say, I at least have to read this to make sure that I'm on track for whatever reason that the dean is now emailing everybody. Um, so those types of things were really important, also making sure that these emails were formulated in a way that was targeted and tailored to the specific departments that we were working with. Um, so we would go in and do presentations to the department heads and talk a little bit about these. And you'll see here, we talked a little bit about the flow of that. We really tried to um, reduce the information about what we would be doing on our end as counselors um, and, and how we might engage um, the students individually with a real focus to this is, what, this is what we're providing you and this is how minimal your involvement needs to be in that in order to really show the students that you're giving them your support. Um, so what we would basically do is to show them these emails right here, sending them that email is all you have to do. And all these emails were previously constructed by us. They're, they would be edited and made personalized to the department that we would do on our own, making sure that the departments felt like there were no barriers for them to be able to offer this as a resource to their students. Um, and we really got a lot of positive things from, from the departments about um, the ease of this, of making this be a part of that. We really were also able to talk with departments about when was a good time to send this email. So um, both during the week and also during the academic year. And some of those things were really helpful that we would have never known as counselors on our campus. Um, so I remember uh, we had sent it out to a group that said, our students are actually not on campus during these couple of weeks because this is the time that they're interviewing for all their jobs. And so, um, so you're not gonna get a lot of responses. And if I hadn't gone to the department and asked those questions about when would be best for them, we would have sent this out at the time that would be the least appropriate for them and not really been able to have them utilize this resources in the way that we we're looking for. So a lot of these um, things we're coming into, again, really tarlet, um, tailoring what that looks like for each of those departments. A little bit also about the responses. Maggie had mentioned that it's really the bread and butter of this program is really in how the counselors are responding to the students. 
So um, we took the student responses from the AFSP suggestions and those templates that Maggie had discussed and really made them our own. We talked a little bit about how um, myself and Jerry were the ones that were the primary responders. So we talked a little bit about how we want to introduce ourselves. How, do we want to say, do we want to put our full like name? Do we want to say I'm a psychologist from here? You know, how do we want to do that and how, what kind of intention do we want behind that? Um, and a, a little bit of it is we had identified it as a way of not saying, you know, here I am, this is somebody that you don't know, but rather this is an opportunity, thank you. Thank you for taking this time to check, check out your health and well-being. And I'm just going to serve here as a resource now. So seeing ourselves as resources, but also seeing the email as an opportunity to provide additional resources. So if a student was maybe mentioning something that might be dealing with um, maybe substance use and abuse or dealing with any kind of other challenges, maybe around financial things, we started to put those resources and adding them into our responses. Even if they never again talked to us, at least they knew how to get that information. And then as we went on down the line, maybe about um, after we had been doing this for a few months, we started to make that a more regular practice and actually had, we have a wellness resource um, website that's connected to the campus and we incorporated that into all of our responses. So even if a student was, um, you know, kind of showing that there wasn't any large risk factors, they still had some ways to be able to connect to resources. And again, what we also did is utilize those bulleted lists to make sure that those responses were also quick. Because we didn't want to say, oh, we got you. Now go ahead and read this long email. But rather to be able to continue to engage with them in the way that they felt comfortable. Um, so a little bit about one of the, the things that we were also able to do with this, this um, unique approach that we took on our campus is that we were able to see our response rate really be at a higher rate than many of the other campuses across the country. The average response rate for this type of program um, sometimes tends to hover around four to eight percent for, um, for students that are responding to this service. And our response rate uh, maintained at about 14 percent throughout the time that we were utilizing this program on our campus. Um, so here's a little bit about the ISP by the numbers on our campus. We invited 337 um, students, and those invitations were based on the numbers that the departments were providing us. Um, and so the numbers tended to fluctuate. What you may also notice is that we weren't necessarily 100% successful in connecting with all of the, all of the campus departments. Um, and that's because I think there's a lot of different reasons why maybe a campus may or may not, or I'm sorry, a department may or may not want to be having this go through their um, system and, or support system. And so, so that's a little bit about um, some of the numbers that we were able to receive. We had 479 students responded. And so just to give you a feel for that, Jerry and I responded to 479 <laughs> and provided 479 counselor responses. Um, in addition to that, students also had an opportunity to continue to dialogue with us, maybe to continue to ask some questions about how to connect with services um, or those types of things. And so 73 of the 479 ended up continuing with the dialoguing. And um, we had about 43 of those students come, came in and sought treatment. There's an asterisk by that number because, again, these students are anonymous. And so in order for the student to identify that they were coming in and seeking treatment, by connecting with us as a, as a counselor through this program, they had to be able to identify that once they walked into the counseling center. That wasn't necessarily a requirement for coming in for treatment. And so um, our numbers, we definitely know that our numbers are higher than that, but we don't have any <laughs> firm grasp about what that looks like because it, it, it is, again, up to the students. Um, so a little bit, and what you also see with those responses is across the tier levels, um, with 1A being at the highest risk level, you see our um, questionnaire respondents across that board as well. And, um, and so I think what we were able to do is that 1A and 1B capture a good amount of students that were um, acknowledging that maybe they had some concerns about thoughts of suicide or any other high risk concerns that were a part of the, a part of the process. Um, what we also saw was that uh, we did have a good number of students that were still utilizing the program, but also identifying that they were either current that they were currently in treatment, um, perhaps on or off campus. And so that was also nice to see that um, what we could do with those counselor responses is really provide them an opportunity to say, "Great job! I'm glad that you're taking care of your health and well-being. I'm glad that you're still connecting with 
somebody that you feel like is going to be helpful to you um, with what's going on as you're going through graduate school. So again, I mean, who gets that kind of response from somebody? Oh, you're going to mental health treatment. I'm so glad. Thank you for doing that. Um, and so it just serves a, as another uh, opportunity to reinforce their treatment engagement. Um, so I'm going to have Jerry come up now and talk a little bit about some of the other information that we gathered there. So how many of you are doing the ISP right now? Anybody? A few of, a few of you. And how many of you are considering the ISP as part of your uh, program? A couple of you, a few of you. Uh, so uh, just wanted to know our, my, our audience. So I'm going to talk about the, the qualitative data. Um, you know, ISP, as you, could, as you heard from Monique, for us was uh, and, and from Maggie, it was rolled out both as a screening tool and as an outreach. So we leveraged this as a way to uh, outreach to students. You know, how do you categorize this in your schedule? Or uh, it's, it's not clinical work, in a, but it is. But it's not a client because we don't, we're, we don't know who this person is. But it's a person, so, uh, and it is uh, a clinician who is responding. So we, uh, we thought of this as sort of an outreach event, a virtual outreach event. So, so we're talking to people anonymously, interacting with them, who have provided some very personal information. Um, uh, but but uh, we're giving them some information about CAPS. And we want, wanted to see how, uh, how this affected their behavior. So we asked them at the end, how, like, how did this affect um, the likelihood that you could seek services at CAPS? And the first one is um, they, they actually sought services. So about 9% of, uh, of the respondents actually came in and sought services. Uh, again, this is just one piece of data. Not everybody responded to this survey. Uh, and then uh, a certain amount said, about 40% said, yes, they're more likely to seek services. So uh, good news. Uh, it, 40% said they were more likely to seek services, and 45% said it didn't really make much of a difference uh, one way or the other. And a, a very few percent said that it did make them less likely to seek services. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later, about maybe some of the reasons why. But I think this slide shows that it's um, mostly doing its job to uh, enhance and encourage students to seek services and reducing stigma. And again, it's, it's, we're asking people to seek to fill this out who may never, what we know that they, they didn't know CAPS, some of them didn't know CAPS existed despite all our, the best uh, outreach efforts that we could do um, because some of them said, wow, I didn't know CAPS was available. They didn't know some of CAPS, that CAPS services was, were free because some of them asked, is this free for a student? I can't afford services. And so we were able to educate them. And um, uh, in the dialogue, we were able to uh, allay some of their fears, uh, to uh, address some of their misconceptions, and to educate them about CAP services in a more personalized way that you can't do um, with in, a, in an outreach sometimes. When somebody is publicly trying to ask about you know, seeking services, sometimes they may or may not, they, they may not want to um, indicate that in a public setting. Uh, so I want to talk a couple, t a little bit about the what people, what students said. So the positive feedback was um, they they really liked how we how thoughtful we carefully addressed their concerns. So we were very thoughtful in constructing uh, our responses. Uh, we tried not to be uh, formulaic, although some people, as you'll hear later, said they thought we were a little bit formulaic. Um, but we actually, uh, this is not uh, a promise for the intervention, but some people felt that this was an intervention in and of itself. They were able to disclose that they were having some difficulties. We gave them some feedback about 
we think you're having these difficulties in these areas, here's our services. They felt, you know, thanks. Um, I'm not going to seek services right now, but I appreciate that you care and you're out there. Um, now, there, um, some of them are already under the care of a counselor, and some, were, some of them had been under the care of a counselor before, and we referred them back to that counselor. Um, and and they, uh, we were able to personalize the feedback, and um, some of the, most of them felt that we, could, we were helpful, we were attentive to their needs. Um, a couple of the negative responses, uh, there's two, a couple of categories. One, um, let's just say that uh, when you're screening, let's take, take a step back here. You're, you're doing a screening event. You're doing a screening program. And you have to construct a screening program that is efficient, where you have a, a brief enough screen that people are not going to get fatigued and say, I'm not going to do this. So the ISP is, an, is a brief screen, um, but it, is, uh, it, it also has to encompass a certain amount of areas. Um, sometimes, <clears throat> uh, so then when somebody screens positive in an area, the, uh, it's, it's clear what we're supposed to do. When somebody is a high risk, they, they're having uh, clear depression, clear anxiety, de suicidal ideation, a clear eating disorder. We know what to do. However, a large proportion of the respondents were what, what we would call tier two. They were in the middle. So they were maybe um, at risk for a mental health concern, um, but maybe not. And so some people felt that we, um, we were over-responding. Uh, we gave a false positive. We, we said, look, uh, we think you could. We tried to construct our uh, response for tier, true, tier two to say you could be experiencing a mental health concern or this could be normal stress. Um, however, some people felt that that was uh, over-responding. Um, and, uh, and so some people said they felt anxious or they felt upset about this uh, survey. Very few people said that, however. Um, and um, uh, the good news is, is because this is an interactive screening program, if they did respond back to it, which they often did, and they often, sometimes they'd say, hey, you know, you said this to me, uh, and I really think I'm doing okay. It's just kind of normal stress uh, of whatever I'm going through at this time, family, graduate school life. Um, uh, but do you think I should seek services? We would be able to dialogue with them and, and say, reassure them. Um, so when they did respond with this feedback to us, we were able to help um, reassure them that if they felt it was okay, then uh, they, they didn't have to seek services. Um, but sometimes people uh, did not do that. Um, also, we had sometimes we did feel like some people gave, some people felt that we gave formulaic answers. So uh, they felt that we didn't really read their comments. Uh, it was a form response. It was answered word for word um, or just populated from the questionnaire uh, or, or listed the issues. Now, um, that's partly the nature of the ISP uh, and partly the nature of what we had to do. Uh, if somebody did have risk areas in a variety of uh, uh, risk factors in a variety of areas, say eating, alcohol, depression, we had to list those areas. Um, if they didn't give us context, sometimes they would give us context in the dialog box. So there's, as Maggie mentioned, there's a box that allows them to say, I'm experiencing a uh, divorce, or I'm experiencing a loss, and this is why I'm experiencing these issues. Or I'm currently in treatment, and I am having these things uh, happen to me. Then we were able to more fully uh, respond to them. If they did list some high symptoms or medium level symptoms in a variety of area, we, areas, we had to respond to those areas. Uh, so uh, some. Sometimes um, 
it, it, it felt formulaic. But believe, believe me, um, uh, Monique and I um, tried to make this as, as standard, as uh, uh, personalized as possible. And again, these are, there are a very few number of people felt uh, negatively about the responses. But we did take these, uh, this feedback and try to be more um, customized and personalized. Um, so another question we asked uh, at CAPS is how did this screening program affect your impression of UCSD counseling services? So we asked before, likelihood of s to seek services, and what about impression? Did it make them think we were, uh, um, it, did it give us a negative impression or a positive impression? And you'll see that um, um, uh, the 40 percent of people said it affected their perception positively, um, and then uh, there was um, a neutral, uh, let's see, I'm looking at this wrong, there was no change. So some people already had a positive or had a negative or had a neutral response of CAP. So we wanted to capture uh, if there was any change. So some people said there was no change. So that was the 30%. And 17% said neutrally. Only a few people said this negatively affected CAPs. Um, so we felt this, that this, uh, it did its job. Um, and Overall, how did this program affect the likelihood that you would seek services? Again, 30-some um, uh, percent said, 30-ish percent said they're more likely. Uh, a certain amount said that it, would, it was neutral, because a fair amount of people already had a, a high likelihood that they would seek CAPS, and a very few pe people said that it would um, negatively affect their uh, ability to, or likelihood to seek services. So, um, most people did recommend that we continue this program. Um, yes, definitely, said most people, um, or uh, yes, probably. Uh, and only 6% um, said no, they did not recommend that we should continue this program. Uh, so 96% or 94% 94, 94 people said we should continue the program. Uh, as you can see, we really try to be attentive to the needs of our clients and get feedback. And, uh, and it's one of the reasons we feel like we got the high response rate. I do want to underscore what Monique said, that we did get a 14% response rate. Again, that's um, about twice the, the normal response rate of the ISP across the country. I think there's a couple of other programs that have a high response rate. But we wanted to make this work. We wanted. We were going to dedicate staff time to this. We wanted to, to actually do this uh, in, in the right way, and we felt that a customized program and uh, tailored and targeted program really helped. Um, so in terms of our resource allocation, you, you might be noted, thinking about how much uh, resources does this kind of program um, uh, require. Uh, they, we recommend, uh, AFSP has a recommendation of one clinician per every 10,000 students. You need to daily check in. Once you launch the program, you need to check in your notifications. You will get an email notification uh, that you have a response. And so you ch need to check that email daily to see if you have a response. And so uh, you uh, need to have a dedicated clinician. And Monique and I switched off. We were on, and the other person was back up. Uh, and then you have a, uh, a lead clinician who, who is sort of the supervisor of the program, uh, who checks the, who makes sure that that program is checked uh, every day, every business day. Uh, and we, it's about four to five hours each week uh, that we put into the program, more or less. Uh, because when we we would get let's say 14 responses in a in a uh, in a day, we would have to uh, it would take a while for us to construct these re, uh, responses. We would have to uh, scan them and look at the tier, look at the information, construct a response based on the standardized response, but try to make it again personalized and give them the feedback. Um, and then we would also have to. Uh, uh, 
respond to dialogues. And um, so that's the resource allocation. Uh, again, we said some lessons learned uh, for us. Uh, again, we say use student and staff input uh, to customize. Use this as part of a larger outreach effort. Make, don't just do this alone. Make this a part of a big package or a larger package that you're offering to a program, to a service. Um, and keep following up um, to see the impact. Uh, we do have stakeholders and departments who are asking us when we can do this again, and we're going to follow up. We're following up with that. Um, and uh, internally, uh, you, you need to build in the staff time for the setup, for the training, the management, the responding, and uh, the clinical time, because you're going to get some new clients. And what AFSP recommends and what we recommend is that you take the clients if at all possible. So you, the client that you dialogue with, you don't just put them in somebody else's email. They have developed a virtual relationship with you and usually they want to work with you. And um, so you have a, an intake time, you put them in your intake schedule. Um, that's how we could do it based on our um, setup. You, you all have your own uh, clinical settings and that you need to customize that to, but that's what uh, we would recommend. It's, it's also, I think, really important to have uh, two clinicians for another reason, and, and that is, is that we, you need to have somebody who understands what you're doing, because Monique and I would regularly consult with each other. So even if we were on, We'd say, hey, look, we've got, I've got somebody who has a unique presentation, who, has, who is high risk, who has not responded to my feedback, who has this issue going on. I can't quite, I don't understand how I should, do you think this response looks okay to this person? Um, this might be your one shot to respond to somebody who is distressed. And um, it's, a, it's a unique situation. This is an anonymous person. You may not get a response back. Um, and you're trying, I don't know if any of you uh, fish, but it's kind of like fishing. Um, I don't know if that's a great analogy, Maggie, but um, it's um, it, fishing in a good way. Um, um, it, it, it's a screening program. You're trying to um, screen the appropriate people. You're trying to frame it in a, an appropriate way. Um, and and, and uh, so, there's a couple times, by the way, that they didn't want to come to see CAPS for a variety of reasons. That was fine with us. Um, for a variety of reasons, they wanted to see somebody off-site. Um, they, they needed services we couldn't provide. We tried to provide that for them. So having another clinician there who's doing the same thing that you're doing um, it, it was invaluable. And it was also invaluable, as, as Monique said, to have the HEAR program. So those are our recommendations. And now we're going to close it up uh, for questions. Open it up for questions. So we'll take questions from the audience. I, I was wondering when you asked um, the follow-up questions in terms of was this useful? Yes, the questions that Jerry had presented on. Yes, so um, we had a little bit of a, um, the way that we had asked the departments to roll that out was that um, we had the invitation email be sent out um, Monday, let's say Monday week one. Uh, Monday week two was the follow-up questionnaire. So the, the follow-up questionnaire email had a link to the questionnaire which was separate from the ISP questionnaire. But it also served f as a reminder for the students if they didn't have an opportunity to fill it out last week that they could go and utilize the ISP this week. So it was just a week lag time from the initial invitation. Yes, anybody that received it that previous week, we're receiving the follow-up um, email. How do you decide on which grad students to send it? Do you guys randomly select? Um, do you have new batches every week as to the new invitations? The, um, we had decided to roll it out department by department. And that was intentional because what we wanted to do was um, have all of the departments go together since most of the graduate students in a department will be working with each other, connecting with each other. That's usually where their social group tends to come out of. 
Um, and we also wanted to do it as a department to reduce any idea that any specific student was being targeted. Um, so they were receiving this because their entire student depart department of, um, was receiving it. And so, and the students were also batched if there was a, we have a few large graduate student departments that are over um, 300 students. And so those, we would actually send them in, in the initial email, we'd let them know that over the next few weeks, students in their department would be receiving this. And again, that was to let them know that even though you may have not received this first, you will be receiving this email in, in these next few weeks' time. Um, that was also based on, like I had said before, it was based on what the departments were actually telling us about when would be best for them to, um, to have this go out to their students. So we would be scheduling them across the quarter. And a little bit also to let you know, we're on a quarter system. We had, um, we had elected before we even had asked the departments to not do it the first week of classes because there's just so much going on and not do it the last week or finals week of classes. And again, because we may have seen an uptick in <laughs> some of our responses um, or the severity of those responses and so, and also that students are focusing on other things at those times. So we wanted to make sure that that was um, appropriate for them. All of our students were um, graduate students, um, but in the survey, in, in the ISP, there is a place to collect demographic information. And so demographics were collected, um, and some of the demographic information included what year of, in their graduate program they were in. We, um, we leave it up to the school to select that, but those are both options. We have a, a number of schools that are specifically reaching out to those groups, uh, especially transfer students. And is that data available from you as to maybe the response rates? Or? Yeah, we see um, it's about 12% is what we're finding. Response, response rates for a transfer student specifically. Any other questions? So you said you get about 14 responses 14. Um, when you send out invitations, right? Yeah, 14%. 14%. Okay. So um, can you do the math for me? Then? How many invitations is that? Like 100, 200? Oh, 4, uh, oh, so I just threw out that 14 number. For so that's, a, a, that's probably out of 100. Pe like a hundred people yeah. were invited. And so um, it, it was important for us to know the response rate uh, in order to cap the number of invitations uh, so that we didn't get deluged by um, responses. So uh, it is important to look at the, uh, the front end and know what you're going to get and know that you, your resources and plan for the resources that you're going to have to use to respond to those. Um, interestingly, the first couple of days after the email was sent out uh, were the highest response days. So it was quickly peaked in the first day or two and then it quickly dropped off. However, um, as, as uh, Monique said, a couple of times we would get some, a little bump after the follow-up. And then, interestingly, we would get a few people who would come back at random times. Um, and also people who would come back at random times um, who we had re replied to and said, you know what, now's the time to seek services. How do I do that again? Um, and so it was really, because we did it for a few years, uh, it was really interesting to see there was a few different ways that people accessed this service and, um, and, and it positively affected them. And, and it's, a, it's an iterative process. So we had initially started, and we didn't know how many responses we were going to get. So we started with, I think, like batches of 50. And that gave us some time to take some time about how we were constructing our responses together. I think those first couple, we ended up doing them all really in tandem. And, um, and then what we were able to do was we had a better sense about how long these responses were taking. Um, we had a 
basically a batch of responses that we can pull from if we needed to have a specific type of response after, that we had already carefully constructed. Um, and then we started to get a little confident and say, let's throw out, let's throw out 100, let's throw out 200 invitations. And I think we were able to, um, to manage that and, and also change that as needed. I think that this is actually what helped us with the graduate students. Since graduate students are all going, their, their, um, yeah, their time is, stress is happening all the time. And, um, but also that there's not necessarily um, kind of like an ebb and flow of the quarter like there are for undergraduate students necessarily. They might be different within their departments. And I actually think that that helped us because um, it en ended up, you know, we have some highs and some lows, but it ended up evening out across all of them. We didn't see any trends particularly connected to the academic calendar. I'm also wondering, like, some departments might have qualifying exams in the fall. Yes. Or the winter blues in the winter. Yes. Like and those types of things were things that we had also asked departments about. So um, there were departments that did have qualifying exams um, in the spring, and so these are conversations that we would have with them. Is it appropriate to do it um, during that second week when they're having them, or do you, do you think it would be helpful to maybe follow up with them and more in the middle of the quarter? And again, all of that, you know, those are things that we didn't know going in, and so that was helpful to really adjust as, we, as much as we could and as much as um, they wanted us to. Yes. And how hard was it to get the head of the department or whoever was in charge of sending those emails to collaborate? So we, um, that's a really good question. I think it, it varied across different departments. Um, we also left it open. So uh, when we would go in and do these presentations, we really like shot, shot for like the highest, like, oh, how about your dean? And, um, and if it wasn't their dean, sometimes it would be more appropriate saying, actually, I'm the person that sends out all the emails to the students about such and such. And so we said, great. You know, if, if that's what makes the department feel more comfortable to send it out with that person, um, sending it out, then, that's, then we were OK with that. So, um, but I think ultimately, consistently, because there was a staff person within the department sending it, we really felt that the support was felt by the students that this was coming from the department. Um, and, and again, some of the, we, this was a lot of the, the um, planning before the departments even sent it out. We would um, make sure that they had a reminder email to send it out when they needed to, and, and all of those things could happen really quickly with like Outlook calendars and those types of things. So um, I, mean, I think we try to make it as easy as possible for them. Is there a question over there? Uh, I, uh, so at this time, we are not rolling out to undergraduates. We're con continuing with graduate students. Um, uh, we, again, we feel like uh, for us, we have uh, so many ways that we outreach in, in, uh, to undergraduates that we, um, we wanted to keep this special um, to graduate students. Uh, there's a, arguments for and against. Uh, I think I, I would be thoughtful in, uh, I, think, I think what Monique and I have, have, have realized is we, we would be thoughtful in who you rolled this out to. Uh, think of the people who are underrepresented uh, in your counseling center who, uh, or uh, maybe you're t more technologically savvy, uh, people who uh, you may not have the best outreach to, a uh, variety of ways that you might you might think, okay, this is a targeted program for them. I don't recommend a sort of a blanket. Uh, put, a, put it up on your, on your website and see who shows up, or a blanket email to everybody. Again, that's, what we're, that's our little contribution to the ISP, is this targeted and tailored. And uh, you may even say culturally sensitive 
uh, uh, way of rolling this out because we're trying to be sensitive to the culture of the student that we're rolling it out to and it shows in our response rate that we if when we say the words in the way that they want us to say it we do it in the way that they want us to do it that it, it results in a better outcome and ultimately this is going to be the face of caps for some of these students so you want to be cautious about who you do so so I would I would look to who you want to target for a variety of reasons either high risk underrepresented under underrepresented in your ca counseling center and um, cost sure yeah so um, actually f and just to piggyback on that a little some of the um, undergraduate populations that have been targeted or that other schools are, are targeting uh, transfer students as we mentioned first year students student veterans is a is a growing population and has been a really unique way to let student veterans on campus know about resources that are specific to them and it's a great way to help them um, with their funding process and a lot of times there's just a lot of stress in um, the paperwork that is involved for them to be on campus and so that has proven to be really really helpful for that population in regards to the cost uh, we have a, a service and license fee of twenty five hundred dollars a year and that covers um, all program functions in terms of your website your domain registration renewal the security certificates that we spoke about, any ongoing training support or changes to the website. Um, for the first year, it's an additional 2500 for a website design development, all the customization. So it's basically 5000 for the first year and then 2500 for each additional year. I should follow that up actually with the fact that um, the majority of our chapters, we have 65 chapters across the country, and many of them are fundraising and doing community walks in your communities, in California in particular, and many of them will sponsor a first year, a second year, a third year implementation of the program. Um, we would never want funding to be a barrier. This is my terrible business person, but we would never want funding to be a barrier for why this program is on your campus, or isn't on your campus. Well, if there are no more questions, we could end early. Good? Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you.